Can you unmute yourself? Hello? You will have to unmute yourself, Doctor. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for your patience and joining in this afternoon. We have amongst us Dr. Satyakam Savaimun. Of, he's a consultant in surgical pathology and cytopathology. He has, uh, is an MD pathologist. He will be discussing today's topic about histopathology diagnosis for bone neoplasms. Bone and soft tissue pathology diagnosis, basically. Thank you. Uh, over to you, Dr. Satyakam. I would request you to unmute yourself. Hello, can you hear us? I am not able to hear you.
Recording in progress. Uh, regret the inconvenience, we will be assuming soon. Okay. Hello, good afternoon. Can you hear me now? Hello, Chetan. Yeah, yeah, Satikam. Okay, I can good hear afternoon. you now. Fine. Sorry for this delay, the PC has some problems, so we'll start. I'm, okay. I'm going to touch upon the histopathology diagnosis of uh, bone and soft tissue lesions. So, so soft tissue and bo lesions are heterogeneous group and the classification is uh, dependent upon the histogenetic basis according to the adult tissue type they resemble. Uh, most of the tumors in soft tissue are benign and they resemble the normal tissue. And they are having a limited capacity for autonomous growth. They generally remain localized and a conservative therapy that is local resection is the treatment of choice. On the contrary, the malignant lesions are locally aggressive or infiltrative and destructive growth pattern. Recurrences are common. Distant metastasis are seen in the late stages. Radical surgery is the choice uh, or in other cases, NACT, RT. As some exceptions like uh, DFA, dermatofibrosarcoma protuberance, which rarely metastasize. So, epidemiology, I'm not going to go much about it, but the most lesions are benign. Age is important in arriving at diagnosis. The symptoms are according to the age and sex of the patient, whether they are superficial or deep. Generally, uh, superficial lesions are, it's a, it's a very vague statement, benign and soft tissue. Uh, sarcomas occur anywhere, but uh, mostly 75% uh, of the locations are in the extremities and 10% each can be seen are seen in uh, uh, trunk and uh, retroperitoneum. There is most uh, slight male preponderance. Pre pre uh, detectable metastasis are seen in some about 10% of the cases at presentation. Histologically, about uh, three quarters of the tumor are UPS, liposarc, glyomyosarc, myxofibroma, fibrosarcoma, uh, synovial sarcoma, or MPNST. Uh, age related incidence, if you talk about uh, embryonal RMS, are exclusively seen in the children. The synovial sarcomas are generally seen in the young adults in 20s, 30s. UPS, liposarcoma, liomyosarcomas, fibro, myxofibro, they are generally in the late. 7th or 8th decade or sometimes 6th decade. Etiology, all of you know, mostly these are chemical carcinogens, radiation induced in uh, second, uh, secondary tumors to the post-radiation, some viral infection like HHV8 and genetic uh, susceptibility like neurofibromatosis, RB1 gene, TP53. So what uh, Diagnostic approach we are having for bone and soft tissue is we need clinical features, we need radiology and histomorphology, that is the tripod. So it's a diagnostic challenge and we require all these findings like what is the age, what is the sex, where it is, where, whether there is a, a painless swelling or it's a painful swelling, whether there is any a joint restriction, whether there is an associated fever, weight loss mobility, fixity to the skin or overlying skin ulceration, which gives us indication that it may be, a, may be a malignant lesion. Radiology is very important as of, as you all know, that X-ray CT scan is the basis, MRI in vertebral region or uh, deep-seated soft tissue lesions. Pet CT and bone scan are generally needed in the metastatic setting and histopathology. What we need is the true, true cut needle core biopsy. Open biopsy, incisional biopsy, excisional biopsy, depending upon the size and site of the lesion. Curettage in the cystic, solid cystic lesion and resection specimen in post tenacity or cases like uh, Ewing sarcoma, osteosarcoma. 
So grossing is very important. Whatever you give us, it should be fixed in 10% buffer formula. I always insist in pathology meeting as well as in clinical meetings that it should be immediately fixed. When the moment to take out the tissue, it should go into the formalin unless you are sending it for the frozen that we'll just touch upon in a few minutes. So uh, otherwise it should all go into the fixation. And if the core biopsy is there or small curettage is there, the minimum fixation time, <coughs> sorry, should be six hours. And if there is a resection specimen, it should be cut at one centimeter apart and in the solid and cystic lesions are just cut up one and uh, cotton is uh, formalin so cotton is put into the cystic cavity and fixed overnight and all grossing should be done by pathologists not by technicians. So the next step is very good quality tissue processing. Many times uh, for example in metastatic lesions the if decalcification what we call light decalcification and uh, routine decalcification so we use strong acids and <clears throat> formic acid as a light acid so uh, weak acid so uh, if decalcification is harsh then the uh, tumor tissue and nuclei get affected and the IHC result and further cytogenetic and molecular results will be affected so this first step of uh, optimum decalcification is very important then comes our uh, routine tissue processing what we call degraded dehydration clearing paraffin impregnation the importance in the paraffin block making is Ideally, if you are giving me cores, say four or five cores, so mostly we put maximum two cores in one block so that uh, we can uh, preserve tissue for further molecular and ancillary uh, cytogenetic studies if you want to have another NGS studies or something. On microtomy from paraffin blocks, three to five micron, good thin sections are important and good quality h &E stain are important to see the morphology. Spatial stain, IHC and molecular, it's all depend upon the morphology which we'll just touch upon. And it should be very judiciously used, not just uh, put many markers because it's very costly. And it actually consumes a lot of uh, finances also. So what histomorphology we look for? So generally we call you, it's looking spindle cell needs IHC, round cell, it needs uh, IHC, epithelioid cells, Pleomorphic tumors. So I, I generally, like I told you, I would like to ask you child, whether it's a child or adult or infant, whether they are superficial or deep, and then we classify and I means club in into the childhood round, adult round, adult spindle, childhood spindle. There are various examples I'm just going to touch upon. These are various uh, round cells. These are various spindle cells. It might look very blue and pink to you, but I'll just tell you what uh, we generally look for. In childhood, generally most common we look for having family tumor, rhabdomyosarcomas, sarcomas and lymphoma. You should not forget lymphoma because extranodal component of lymphoma do, uh, do happen in other areas. Spindle cells in childhood, schwannoma, neurofibromas, lymphoma, sarcomas, fibrosarcomas, infantile one are common. In adults, generally LMS, RMS, fibrosarcoma, I have not uh, mentioned all the entities, just most common ones like synovial. In round cell, as usual, Ewing's, rhabdo, DSRCT in the abdominal uh, cavity like mesentery, clear cell sar sarcoma in the thigh, ASPS, paraganglioma in the retroperitoneum, adrenal region specifically, granular cell lesion can happen from tongue to anal canal anywhere. Epithelioid sarcoma is the extremities, epithelioid angio and uh, hemangioendothelioma, ASPS. Again, these are the differential in epithelioid morphology also. So I'm just uh, not to bore you with the some patterns I'll show you. This is the typical spindle, what we call fascicle, interlacing fascicle of spindle cells, which on higher power showing, we call previously used to call cigar shaped, blunt ends. Here again, typical uh, lymoid sarcoma showing some collagen deposition this typical cigar shaped nuclei but on the contrary if you see this mitosis it's a it's going into the malignancy this is lyomite sarcoma so we just run basic markers which i'll again uh, in tell you in nutshell this is sma this is Des desmond h caldesmon is confirmatory for the smooth muscle and ki is actually not needed in soft tissue i have just shown it this is malignant lesion frankly you can make out the as compared to the previous these are very bland looking cells and here you are seeing very darkish looking 
some uh, pleomorphism mitotic figure which was desmin positive and in uh, rhabdoid we uh, go, go for myogen in myod1 ki is again just for the completion island this is one of the uh, common thing uh, not very common but uh, if we see myxoid areas we should uh, think about the myxofibrosarcoma because i am here seeing some stellate cells spindle cells this is infiltrating into the skeletal muscle and in myxoid also comes uh, extra skeletal myxoid chondrosarcoma it comes in as the myxoid liposarcoma so depends upon the site and uh, age matters this is one of the typical we call staghorn kind of blood vessels where we see short spindle to oval cells doesn't show much pleomorphism or mitotic activity so here my differential will be uh, sft a solitary fibrous tumor versus evening sarcoma so i'll put the battery of ihc is here cd34 cd99 bcl2 sma desmin uh, calponin ema ck7 uh, bcl2 and ki is not that role but we generally just ck7 is also one of the differential in the biphasic tumor here though i am not able to show you the uh, epithelial differentiation so these markers will help us into if i i get cd34 positive i'll go for the stat6 which will confirm my sft if uh, i get cd34 negative with 99 bcl2 focal ema positive ck7 positive i'll go for evening sarcoma which i'll do tle1 if it comes positive it will confirm so you may or may not need for need to go for the cytogenetics molecular genetics this is one of the low grade or localized uh, malignant lesion which is we call dermatofibrosarcoma this is epidermis and this is the small portion of dermis and this is the bland looking tumor in the deep dermis and subcutis which is again shows small fascicles i'll just show you some round cell tumors these are all pink cytoplasm and blue nuclei this cd99 positive so it's a evening family tumor this is mucosa with some pink cell lot of lot of uh, pink cytoplasm these are rhabdoid cells so rhabdomyosarcoma these are another round cell pink cytoplasm eccentrically placed nuclei so i did cd138 kappa positive lambda negative so restriction is important to show but sometimes we may not get some restriction there so sometime uh, these are another example where you see contrary differentiation with uh, spindly cells or some oval cells it's a extra skeletal myxoid chondrosarcoma chondrosarcoma you get some vascular differentiation so all these features we look into what it differentiating into you can here make out the uh, mitotic figure lot of cytoplasm pink cytoplasm so this we did cd34 and 31 to uh, make it as a diagnosis of uh, hemangio endothelioma this is another example which is showing a round cell with pink cytoplasm this was in uh, presacral region and on hypo you can make out these are little medium to large cells uh, having abundant cytoplasm and some myxoid background so uh, this was a uh, coldoma in the presacral region this is epitheloid component which is showing large nodules so uh, here uh, always we put ck also to say whether it's a epithelial or uh, it's a mesenchymal so mesenchymal uh, component will show you the vimentin positive and here you will see the ck as well as uh, vimentin positivity so whenever we are seeing any uh, 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 epitheloid morphology associated with any mucosal structure one should always consider uh, sarcomatoid carcinoma it can happen in any 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 organ system so some example of benign like how they differentiate toward this is the benign most lesion typical uh, fibrovascular septa and lobules of the mature adipocytes lipoma contrary to this you can make out little larger nuclei which on the higher power you can see these are indenting into the nucleus what we call lipoblasts so this is well differentiated liposarcoma i'll just narrate one or two uh, examples of bone tumor where you are seeing classical uh, it's more than codman's triangle showing lot of uh, bone formation here 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 so on when you give us the core biopsy so lot of pink material we see that is the lacy osteoid 
and these are moderate mild to moderately pleomorphic oval nuclei of osteoblasts osteo here you are seeing a chondroid differentiation so this is chondro chondroblastic osteosarcoma this is spindle cell which are infiltrating into the in between bony trabecula and destroying the bony trabecula this is fibroblastic variant of osteosarcoma this is one of the uh, tricky situation where we have to employ a cd9 uh, cd99 but that is not the definitive because we have to look for the other features like here you are seeing a lot of uh, round cell pattern with if you look carefully on the higher power we could see some lacy osteoid so this was the small cell variant of osteosarcoma this is another typical picture of living sarcoma where you are seeing these round cells which i already shown you cd99 positive this is again i have shown you about the uh, plasma cytoma or plasma cell lesion the entire uh, pelvic plate and iliac bone is involved and on morphology i am seeing lot of cartilage which are raggedly infiltrating into the bone destroying the bone so generally i don't call uh, who grade 1 it's grade 2 or grade 3 chondrosarcoma because uh, we have to look for the nuclear pleomorphism mitosis sometimes we always say per lacuna two cells or three cells whatever but generally i don't call it grade 1 it's mostly grade 2 or grade 3 so i have not touch upon all the nitty gritties i have just shown the most common ones so wherever we need ihcs what ihcs somebody told me to just touch upon the ihc so uh, these many markers we put for uh, spindle cells like cd34 and 31 for angio differentiation sma caldesmon for smooth muscle desmin myogen in myodin for uh, rhabdoid s100 for neural cd99 vcl2 helps us in sft or and wings beta catenin i i didn't touch upon the fibromatosis or uh, any uh, other nodular fasciitis or other lesions which always comes in as a differential in various organ like anterior abdominal wall one should consider about what you call desmoid is a fibromatosis then i told you about ckema epithelioid lesions or sarcomatoid carcinoma ki is not i have just mentioned just just for the heck of it but generally ki is not needed there is no role of ki in uh classification or subtyping of the tumors soft tissue tumor sorry so round cell basically we have to look into melanoma sorry i have forgot to tell you melanoma comes as a differential in all the all the tumor because melanoma can have any morphology uh, round cell spindle cell epithelioid so we have to include uh, hmb45 s100 melane to always exclude the melanoma component and uh, if it is mucosa related so always think about the uh, neuroendocrine epithelioid again i told you lot of things about including melanoma the pleomorphic one again ck rhabdo and smooth muscle everybody comes so what is my role in uh, giving you the diagnostic and prognostic information should be there for you as well as the patient and it can be achieved only when you give us the good uh, quantity of uh, tumor or a representative sample of tumor in core biopsies i would like to give you type subtype grading response in cases of resection we take a lot lot of sections uh, we call a tumor grid and we tell you the percentage of uh, viable and non viable tumor we tell you about the margin status and pathologic stage so whenever you uh, you find a report complete report you should ask for all these findings whether which uh, location it is we uh, we should know whether you are taking it from the epiphysis metaphysis diaphysis that's all, that also helps us in arriving at some some uh, judgment so we we look for all these findings histologic grade mitotic grade necrosis and we give you all this percentage lvi margin status lymph node if you have planned and if you are taking the lymph nodes out same with the soft tissue uh, we are having same criteria mitotic rate necrosis for fnc lcc grading lvi again margin status are important and ancillary studies wherever needed frozen section as i told you when you need it because bony tissue we can't uh, cut on the cryostat uh so generally uh, soft tissue component we separate out from the if you are taking some curettage in the 
cystic lesion, whether you are suspecting some unicameral or cyst or ABC or GCT, then it's uh, it's actually a tricky situation. But we snap freeze it at uh, minus 20, 21 or 22 degrees centigrade, take uh, 5 microns thin sections, rapid tall blue or uh, HNE sections. General indications are like this and then uh, margin status or if you are planning or, or suspecting any lymph node med meds, uh, once uh, when Manish was here, we have got one lymph node in axilla in a case of Ewing sarcoma of uh, scapula where there was uh, metastasis in axillary node. I remember Dr. Murad uh, dissected the axillary node and uh, sent us for uh, frozen whether it's metastatic, then they, they went ahead with the complete axillary dissection. Thank you. If there are any questions, you can ask. These are my references. These are my acknowledgements. Uh, this, uh, Dr. R.B. Deshpande is retired now. He was with me. I, I learned a lot of things from him. Dr. Bhaduri Chitra Madhiwal is still there. Manish Agarwal was with us. Now he is shifted to another private hospital. And these are my junior colleagues and colleagues who helped me. Thank you. Hello. 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 Chitish, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. But I, I nobody asked me anything, so I thought ki I'm not audible over. No, no, uh, I can hear too. Okay. But yeah. we are only on the panelist group and we cannot see uh, uh, we cannot see the audience. Audience can, is not on our group. Q&A. You can go to Q&A. So we have to go to Q&A. So, so um, if anybody wants to ask Dr. Satyakam question, uh, please put it in Q&A because uh, we won't be able to hear you. So... Yeah, so maybe we'll so, we can take questions for you. Yeah, somebody has written uh, spine cancer that my uh, patient has a uh, uh, brother-in-law had spine cancer metastasis from breast cancer. Yeah, I didn't touch upon about the metastatic lesions where uh, we suspect uh, epithelial means carcinoma metastasis where uh, I I told you that. Uh, Decalcification is the most important thing and their uh, big role of IHC. What we say is the first line, we always put pan-cytokeratin and CK7 and 20. That guides us where it is. If I get CK7 positive, then generally uh, we suspect in breast, lung, uh, in females, ovarian uh, you know, serous carcinomas or uh, if it is 7 plus 20, then pancreatic biliary or urothelial carcinoma. If it is 20 positive, at least in India, it is colorectal because generally we don't see Merkel cell here. But if it is CK720, both negative, then multiple uh, like hepatocellular carcinoma, adrenocortical carcinoma, pancreatic adrenocortical comes into the and accordingly we put the different IHCs for that. Any other question? All Thank right, you everyone. Think, if anybody yeah. has a question, you can raise your uh, hand and uh, you can note your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, we move on to the, thank you, uh, Dr. Satyakam, for your detailed uh, diagnosis related uh, slides. We will move on to the second speaker of the day, Dr. Siddhich. Okay. Uh... Uh, Dr. Shetich will be enlightening us about spine metastasis and algorithmic approach. He's a consultant spine surgeon at PD Induja Hospital. Over to you, Doctor. So I I hope you can see my screen. Um, yes. All right. Could you be a little louder? So yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. All right. So, yes. So, I'm going to give you a brief uh, about uh, 
spinal metastasis and how we approach it uh, uh, in a systematic fashion so here um, so this is you can see this is a middle aged person who came to our opd with severe neck pain numbness going down the arms no weakness he was walking and he was carrying this large thyroid swelling in his neck for many many years that thyroid swelling was considered benign he practically had it for years together uh, but then he presented with this which prompted investigation and then the diagnosis came out to be thyroid carcinoma this another patient uh, a 60 year old woman um, she had back pain uh, she had visited several uh, physicians and doctors for back pain and uh, as usual most of the back pain was written off as uh, just degenerative back pain then eventually someone said that it is osteoporotic uh, fracture and that's why back pain so this mri was never done but in the background there was a history of breast cancer which was operated and then he she had treatment for that so by the time she came to the opd in our clinic um, and then she had gotten an mri she had already started developing uh, sim neurological symptoms so the diagnosis was delayed and it was not picked up when she was having that uh, back pain so uh, this is the most important slide for you uh, you will be seeing a lot of uh, back pain patients in your practice and uh, most of back pain patients are sort of benign they don't really have a disease uh, and it is a degenerative conditions postural back pain muscular back pains but it's important to remember that um, elderly patients or for that matter any patient with a history of cancer especially those kind of cancers that have a predilection for going to bone uh, prostate breast and those sort of cancer should uh, uh, sort of warn you that that back pain may not be benign and uh, metastasis related back pain uh, can be very similar to degenerative back pain but the temporal history is such that the pain keeps worsening every uh, uh, every week the patient is getting more and more pain they might get rest pain the pain that disturbs their sleep wakes them up um, wakes them up at night so those kind of back pain uh, associated with a history of cancer you should be uh, wary and get an mri obviously by the time the patient develops weight loss and other problems of metastatic cancer it is probably too late so it's important to know that almost 70% of all cancer patients will develop metastasis and this number has been increasing because our ability to detect them with mris and pet cts and plus the patients uh, now are living longer and longer with uh, earlier surgeries and newer systemic uh, treatment that oncologists provide now 40% of these metastases are going to be spinal metastases in fact spinal metastasis is the most common site of bony metastasis and the third most common site of metastasis after liver and lung and 20% of those spinal metastasis will develop epidural spinal cord compression and a neurological problem the most common cancers uh, to metastasize to the spine like i said are prostate lungs and breast now these have a special affinity for bone and the cancer cells will migrate to remote sites they enter the blood stream and they will find a fertile ground for implantation and multiplication and bone for some of these types of cancers provides an extremely fertile soil to lat latch on and allow that tumor cell to grow now the bone is in a constant uh, phase of remodeling and this process is release a lot of growth factors from the bone that help the tumor grow the tumors themselves secrete cytokines and some molecules that induce osteoclasts to release more growth factors from the bone marrow which in turn promotes the growth of tumor cells establishing a sort of vicious cycle that allows the metastatic cells to take a hold in the bone and then keep multiplying 
Now there are two consequences of spinal metastasis. The tumor cells uh, from the bone they can break out and cause a mass-like effect that causes epidural spinal cord compression, which obviously can result in a neurological deficit. The other thing that the tumor cells can do is that it will weaken the bone. Uh, to us to an extent that it can cause pathological fracture and pain so there are two things obviously epidural spinal cord compression is quite dangerous as it threatens the spinal cord and it actually is an oncological or a surgical emergency the reasons for that is that patients with epidural compression are prone for a sudden neurological decline one day the patient is neurologically intact and grade 5 power and overnight the patient can develop weakness and loss of walking ability in fact rapid deterioration neurologically is the most common presentation of an epidural spinal cord compression and once the walking ability is lost it is difficult to recover in spite of treatment so if a patient loses ability to walk only 30 percent will re ever regain back that ability to walk again and if completely paraplegic then the chances of recovery are even lesser than 5%. If the paraplegia lasts for more than 48 hours, then the recovery is almost impossible. And therefore, the primary aim of our treatment is to maintain neurology and ambulation and not to treat a decline or a neurological deficit. So in addition to pain control, which will happen because of the tumor itself or fracture, the two palliative goals are the main reasons why we offer treatment to these patients. So this is a 70 year old male, uh, has a neurological deficit, almost grade zero power with bladder bowel involvement for the last seven days. And this is the osteoblastic metastasis you can see in the spine. His PSA levels are 150, which suggests that this is a prostate malignancy. Now there are four treatment options available, chemotherapy or systemic therapy, radiotherapy, vertebroplasty and surgery. And let's look at each one of them as an alternative to surgery as surgery remains the last option. Chemotherapy is usually used as an adjunct and it's almost never used as a sole treatment for spinal metastasis except for those with mild symptoms or very chemosensitive tumors like myeloma or lymphoma. For spinal cord compression or for painful metastasis because of fracture, the treatment effect of chemotherapy alone is very delayed and that's why it's not used as the primary treatment modality. When we consider radiotherapy as the treatment alternative to surgery, we have to understand the difference between radiosensitive and radioresistant tumors. This is primarily determined by spinal cord tolerance to conventional external beam radiation. In radiotherapy, the entire path along the tumor gets the same dose of radiation and the spinal cord being in this path gets the same dose of radiation as the tumor. The spinal cord can tolerate up to 30 grays of radiation. More radiation can cause spinal cord damage and paralysis. So therefore, those tumors that are effectively killed by a dose less than 30 gray are radiosensitive and those that cannot be killed effectively at this dose maximum are radioresistant. So this is a patient with multiple myeloma with paraparesis for last two days. He got radiotherapy of 60 gray in eight fractions and the MRI after 10 days shows that the tumor has melted away. This is an ultra sensitive tumor to radiation. In contrast, this is a 65 year old female with a renal cell carcinoma and an L3 metastasis presenting with radiculopathy gets a conventional external beam radiation, but the tumor progresses and still causes paraplegia. Radio, uh, RCC or renal cell carcinoma is a radio resistant tumor. That's why this treatment did not work. So these are the examples of different kinds of tumors that are very radiosensitive, myeloma, lymphoma, seminoma, whereas radioresistant tumors are usually the solid organ tumors like colon, lung, renal cell, melanoma, sarcoma. So broadly, there are two different types of radiotherapy technologies that we have. 
the older one is the conventional external beam radiation where the entire path gets the same amount of radiation and the second one which is the more advanced technology that is stereotactic radio surgery or srs for short in that only the tumor gets a high dose of radiation and it spares the surrounding normal structures including the spinal cord so it's important to know the difference between these two now when srs came as a stereotactic radio surgery and hinduja hospital one of was one of the first uh, hospitals actually was the first hospitals in the country to get srs it's called the gamma knife uh, and because of this technology no tumor tissue is radio resistant anymore because a high dose of radiation can be targeted on the tumor without injuring the uh, injuring the spinal cord however there is one limitation of stereotactic radio surgery it has to do with the severity of the spinal cord compression in low grade epidural spinal cord compression that does not have tumor tissue distorting the shape of the spinal cord in high grade uh, uh, epidural spinal cord uh, compression the tumor tissue distorts the shape of the spinal cord so srs can be given in low grade epidural compression without the risk of injuring the spinal cord but in high grade epidural spinal cord compression the srs can injure the spinal cord as there is not much of a margin between the tumor and the spinal cord so the spinal cord will get the radiation and will get injured so radiotherapy overall is not so good option for spinal instability which is defined as the loss of spinal integrity due to the metastasis like for example a fracture and a fracture will cause movement related pain deformity or neural compromise on loading and therefore mechanical problems uh, require mechanical solutions and radiotherapy will not work for example this is a 60 year old male uh, who had oral carcinoma with a l3 metastasis received radiotherapy about a month ago for to the spine however he developed severe back pain and left leg pain which was there on sitting and the moment he was lying down he was getting relief you can see a pathological fracture in l3 with a compression of the cauda equina so when you get his sitting x rays you can see the spine is collapsing at the fracture site and in supine position it kind of opens up now you can imagine no amount of radi radiation to this kind of a fracture will help him because radiotherapy cannot stabilize the spine which brings us to vertebroplasty now this can be used for certain kinds of fracture and instability related pain and we place a needle in the fractured bone and inject bone cement to harden it up and this can provide significant pain relief to the patient so this is a 53 year old woman with severe back pain on loading of the spine bed ridden because of multiple myeloma mainly because of the pain there is an l1 fracture that you can see there which is the cause of pain we did a vertebroplasty which is injection of cement in that bone and she got an instant relief the moment the injection was uh, the cement hardened up in contrast this is a patient with oral cancer we saw earlier there is no posterior wall of the vertebral body there is epidural compression also so if you put cement here in the l3 vertebra that cement is going to leak out of the bone and cause more compression of the neural elements because there is no cavity there as such the bone is destroyed especially if that is close to the dural sac so vertebroplasty is not possible in all patients like example this patient now lastly the surgery there are two broad kinds of surgery we do for metastasis one is more minimally invasive uh, surgery where you open very less and the other is a more open surgery where which is the conventional surgery and ob for obvious reasons the minimally invasive surgery is more favorable because these patients are vulnerable uh, and such large wounds when we open and do a lot of dissection they can cause wound problems these are nutritionally compromised patients they are going to get radiotherapy in this area in the future uh, so these kind of open surgeries are used less and less these days wherever possible we are doing a minimally invasive surgery where we open with smaller incisions uh, use percutaneous screws we avoid large resections and allow for radiotherapy to, to take care of the rest of the tumor to achieve better uh, local tumor control now separation surgery is one such surgery 
So remember in the previous slide, I said that the stereotactic radio surgery is not effective for high grade epidural spinal cord compression. In those patients, we use kind of MIS or minimally invasive technique, like put in a tube uh, in the area where there is spinal cord compression, peel off the tumor from the spinal cord, create a gap between the tumor and the spinal cord. And once the gap is created, after that, you can give a very high dose of radiation to the tumor because now the spinal cord is not close to that tumor and then that's the way to achieve good local tumor control. So this is how the SRS uh, works like you separate it away from the dura and then give radiation. So the decision making in these is uh, sometimes complex because every cancer is different. We require a team approach that we take a help of several clinicians, the radiation oncologist, the medical oncologist. Um, spine surgeons, the orthopedic oncosurgeons. So it's a team approach where every patient gets a tailored treatment. Sometimes these treatment decisions are hard to make because we are treating patients who are terminal and we need to take decisions wisely. We are treating patients for their pain and for palliation only and not for curative purpose. So doing any aggressive surgeries or interventions uh, are unlikely to help such patients. That's why we focus on more minimally invasive techniques to give relief and improve the quality of life in the last few months to few years of these patients. So that's it. Thank you very much. I'll end my talk here. Thank you very much, Dr. Shitich. Request anybody who has questions to raise your, raise your hands. We will allow you to talk. Or you can put your questions in the Q&A box. So one question was, my brother-in-law had spine cancer, but it was metastasis from breast cancer, male breast cancer um, with severe back pain. How common is this cancer? It is very uncommon to have breast cancer in males. Um, uh, it, the more common is uh, obviously is in women, uh, but uh, this, this is very unusual to have, have something like this. Uh, we have Dr. Kedar Oak. No. Uh, you have a yeah, question? My, question. my question was for the previous speaker. So, you know, you put the okay. email, so I will email him. So, Thank you. Uh, we will move on to the next. Uh, so, there are a lot of then hands then. I can see. So, um, if you want to, you can ask in the chat box and I will answer. Can I share my screen? Okay, so uh, we move on to the next uh, and the last speaker of the day. I saw people are asking questions on audio, so we can yeah, take. Yeah, so I have minutes. allowed them to talk. We okay. have allowed them to talk, but uh, somehow I think it's done by mistake. Uh, if anybody has questions, you can put it in the Q and A box. In meanwhile, we'll wait for fifteen seconds. We can seconds wait for five because, minutes. Uh, ah, once okay. we start with Doctor Chetan Anchan, then it will disturb him. The yes, if we unmute. Okay. So are, are people able to unmute themselves and speak? Yeah, I've allowed them to talk. Maybe it's not working. So, uh, anyway. Dr. Deepali, if you can unmute yourself, uh, Dr. Pralad, Dr. Sharda, Dr. Abdul. So I, I don't think it is working. So maybe we can see if they can. Um, yeah, they can the put it in the Q and A box. Yeah. Okay. So okay. yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Shall I share my screen? Uh, yes, doctor. So uh, today, Dr. Uh, Chetan Anshan, who is an orthopedic oncologist, will be talking on the topic management of pathological fractures of long bones. Over to you, doctor. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah, so I'll be... So I'll be speaking about management of pathological factors of long bones. 
Uh, I will start with the case. Basically, this is an illustrative uh, presentation that you will be able to connect to what I am talking. Why pathological fracture is different from the regular fractures that we are more familiar with, and that is the whole point of this. Uh, so, this is an 18-year-old male had a femur fracture following the fall at home. He had severe pain, was unable to stand and walk, and that was his X-ray. Clearly, uh, we can make up. Yes, Doctor Anshan, your uh, voice is cracking. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, better. Is it better? Yes. Let me know if it's a problem. Then I will have to try some other way. We are using a Bluetooth. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So uh, this is the MRI of the same patient. We showed again, you know, a pathological process in the proximal uh, femur with a pathological fracture. Patient went to his orthopedic surgeon who did a uh, Enders nailing. Enders nailing is one of the intermediary devices. It's a sort of a long nail that we use to fix fractures. This is one of the older devices, not very popular in the cities, but it is a very practical device in places where you have limited resources, and it is also very uh, cost-effective treatment. So you pass multiple long nails all the way from the distal part of the femur into the neck of the femur. That is how you fix uh, fractures with the dental. Somehow his pain didn't go away. It in fact increased, and he had a large swelling in the thigh. You know, few weeks time. He went again back to the surgeon who did an open biopsy, which showed, uh, you know, was reported as giving sarcoma. And when he presented this was his situation you can now see a large swelling in the proximal thigh with a huge destructive process you see most of the proximal half of the femur is missing those ender nails are practically floating in the air now by the time he came he was extensively metastatic and he was only suitable for palliative care and he received some treatment and he passed away in a few months the question is could he have been managed better absolutely was all this avoidable completely would it have changed the outcome of this patient knowing the fact that he is suffering from cancer very likely so what has happened here is this patient has suffered iatrogenic damage caused due to inappropriate surgery a relatively localized disease has been interfered with contaminating the entire femur and the thigh Seriously compromising the limb sign. It only gave temporary symptomatic relief, but worsened his oncologic situation. And moreover, it also uh, led to a delay in the diagnosis and his eventual treatment, which has proved deadly for him. So, how did all this happen? The simple explanation is that it was because his fracture was managed like a traumatic fracture. So, what's the difference between a pathological fracture and a traumatic? It's a fracture, nonetheless. Patient is definitely disabled and in agony because of the fracture, and it is very commonsensical to you know expect that it should be fixed as soon as possible. You deal with the fracture first, make him comfortable, and then you can deal with the pathology. And that is what you know logic will sort of tell you. Because once his pain is gone, he will be easier to manage, and then you can do all your investigations and then deal with the pathology. However, this logic works if you are thinking like a trauma surgeon. Unfortunately, pathological fractures are different. Here, the pathological part is the actual problem, not the fracture. So, as an easy reminder, in a pathological fracture, the pathology comes first. You already saw what happens if you fix it. And then you know, worry about the pathology. So, what is a pathological fracture? It is a fracture of a bone which is weakened due to any condition, disease, or condition. And how is it different from a traumatic fracture? In a traumatic fracture, the bone is healthy; it is not at fault. A healthy bone will heal once the alignment and integrity of the fracture is restored and maintained. And that's what a orthopedic surgeon will do with all sorts of you know fixation. In a pathological fracture, on the other hand, the bone is diseased, which implies that the fracture would not have happened otherwise. So, it is the disease in the bone that needs to be addressed, and not just the fracture. 
the fracture is actually a distraction. So then how do you deal with a pathological fracture? Well, here we first focus on identifying and understanding the pathology. How you treat the fracture will depend on what pathology has led to the fracture. Some of these conditions, if you treat improperly, can have life and death threatening consequences, as we already seen in the introductory case. So it's important for you to remember that treating the fracture is secondary to treating the disease. So when should you suspect a pathological fracture? So whenever a patient comes with a history of fracture following a trivial injury, where you generally don't expect a you know, you know, patient to suffer a long bone or a major bone fracture, like a simple fall at home or a minor stumble. Some of them, you know, probably fracture when they are just trying to stand. The other important clues are history of muscle pain or swelling prior to the incident. Any past history of cancer or tumor and any past history of similar fractures. All of these are very, very important clues for you to suspect the possibility of a pathological fracture in your patient. And later on, of course, you want to identify whether there is a pathological fracture. For you, for that, you will have to do the imaging. And most important imaging for us is the X-ray. And when the X-ray is not giving us adequate information or where you see more information, you will have to go for an MRI. Once you know that you are dealing with a pathological fracture, you need to do a detailed workup of your patient, which will include doing specific blood tests, advanced imaging in the form of uh, MRI with contrast or CT scan, PET CT scan and a biopsy. Identifying the pathology is very important. That is, you have to reach a diagnosis about what pathology you are dealing with. Once you know that you are dealing with the malignant pathology, you also need to stage the patient. What is staging? Staging is to basically understand the extent of disease burden in the patient. That is to know whether the patient is having a localized disease or whether the patient is having metastasis. Once all of this information is in your hand, you can then decide about how to treat this patient. And treating the patient starts with how you are going to treat the disease. Whether you are going to treat the patient with a curative intent or with a palliative intent, whether you will need systemic treatment or whether you will manage only with local treatment or whether you will need both. Now, I will show you a few cases where we will illustrate all these points so that it will be easier for you to understand what I am saying. This is a 14 years old girl who had a trivial fall in school about a pathological fracture of the proximal feet. That was her x-ray at presentation. Very clearly, we are seeing a pathology in the proximal femur. That was her x-ray MRI, which also shows, you know, a destructive pathology in the proximal femur. A biopsy was giving sarcoma. This is exactly the same condition which our first introductory patient had. So this girl had giving sarcoma, that boy also had giving sarcoma. Now this patient was managed differently. Here a PET CT was done for the patient, which showed no other lesion in the body. So she had a localized giving sarcoma of the proximal femur with a pathological fact. So how do you treat this condition? You start with Neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Neoadjuvant chemotherapy is chemotherapy treatment that you start before you do any local treatment of this patient. So we just gave her skin, skin traction and started her on chemotherapy. After nine weeks of chemotherapy, her pain was almost gone. She had some shortening, but she was above, she was able to move around non weight bearing with the help of a walk. At that time, we did a fresh imaging. And that was an X-ray after nine weeks of chemotherapy. You see, on an X-ray, the fracture has healed. On MRI, all the soft tissue has almost disappeared. The soft tissue is swelling around. And on PET, there is practically no metabolic activity in the area of the fracture. You see, the metabolic activity is almost identical on both sides. The central bright area you are seeing is the bladder. That is the uh, radio pharmaceutical being flushed out. So this is how we started before neoadjuvant chemotherapy and this is how it is after the neoadjuvant chemotherapy and that is when she is due for her surgical treatment. So what we did was a wide excision of the proximal femur and did a reconstruction with a mega processes using a bipolar hemiarthroplasty implant. Subsequently, she also received local adjuvant radiotherapy. Those are her intraoperative treatments. 
this is the proximal femur so the fracture was just not that it had united of course mal united but nonetheless united so this specimen was sent to the pathologist who reported excellent response to chemotherapy almost 100% necrosis and all the margins of resection were free of disease that is a post op accident with the mega processes implant after which he was allowed to walk full bed so the lesson here is pathological fracture is not a surgical emergency pathological fracture in primary bone sarcoma is also not a contraindication for limb salvage just because she had a fracture doesn't mean that she has to do the limb most importantly is to identify the disease and treat the disease and not just the fracture case number 2 This is a 6 years old lady who suffered a fall, fractured her thigh bone, and on X-ray showed a femur fracture. She went to her local orthopedic surgeon, who did a good job, did a very uh, well-aligned uh, reduction and uh, interlock nailing. Looks very well fixed. Eight months later, patient comes back to him with severe pain, unable to bear weight and walk, and having a large size swelling and if you look at the x-ray it shows a large destructive process in the area of her fracture there is a large soft tissue mass and the bone is you know sort of getting eaten away a biopsy was done which revealed a metastatic tumor likely from pyloid tumor of breast now if you look at this x-ray i mean i am in mean, what four tumors for last 20 years I mean, I wouldn't call this pathological at first glance at all because it looks like a high velocity uh, fracture of the femur, and I don't blame the surgeon for going ahead with this uh, surgery. So, was there any way we could have made out that this was a pathological fracture? Yes, we could. If a detailed history of this patient was taken, well, when asked, he did reveal that he fractured following a trivial fall at home. That is the first clue. She also had progressively worsening pain in the region since a couple of months. In fact, she was limping for almost two months. And on inquiry, the patient revealed that she was treated for breast cancer, a breast tumor, two years ago. So all the red flags were there. It was just that nobody thought about it, and the patient did talk about. It. And patient will not reveal things unless you specifically ask for these things. So, how do we identify a pathological fracture? Majority of cases you can identify on the X-ray. Some cases like this one are not so easy. However, clinical history and past medical history are very very helpful pointers. Just these four questions: How did you get this fracture? Did you have any pain in the region prior to the fracture? Do you have any past history of similar fractures? And have you been treated for cancer in the past? That would open up everything. case number 3 this is a 55 years old gentleman known case of renal cell carcinoma with skeletal metastasis suffered a pathological fracture of the proximal femur a close interlock nailing was done around 8 months in surgery he develops he comes with a large swelling in the thigh severe pain and has been bedridden since about 3 months that is his x-ray showing again a destructive pathology in the proximal femur there is no way he can wait there on this uh, reconstruction So the lesson here is, you can't just fix a pathological fracture and expect it to unite like a routine fracture. So this is the problem. You just put in a nail at that moment, the patient feels fine, but it is not going to last. That's why, because the tumor is there and it will continue to grow, and the reconstruction is destined to fail soon. The disease in the bone has to be taken into consideration while planning the treatment of the fracture. So, whenever you do surgery for a pathological fracture due to metastasis, your reconstruction must be durable, and it should be designed to outlive the patient. It should give maximum pain relief while at the same time allowing useful function. There is no single formula for reconstruction. That really depends on you know lot of these factors. So, your reconstruction strategy should be tailored, taken into consideration the various variables. which include the type of disease the location of the disease the expected survival of the patient clinical situation of the patient and cost concern case number 4 this is a 60 years old lady 
no case of breast cancer who had a pathological fracture of femur that was her x-ray mri again showing a neoplastic lesion in the area of the fracture which was confirmed as metastasis of breast cancer now how do you treat this well we did an interlock kneeling we opened the fracture site curated around all the disease there and filled that cavity with a material called as bone cement now bone cement is a surgical material which comes as a powder and a liquid you just mix it on table and it create a putty and that putty you pack into this uh, cavity in the bone and in about 10 15 minutes it becomes rock solid it's even stronger than bone now what are the benefits i'll come to that so in the absence of any compelling contraindication in a pathological fracture of long bone due to metastasis the fracture site should be opened thoroughly curated to remove all microscopic debris and after the fixation of the fracture with a suitable implant the defect of the cavity in the bone should be packed with bone cement there are several advantages to bone cement it is very very strong in compression you can make a car run over it and it will not break this reconstruction that we have done on this lady and sure uh, will be stronger than her normal side bone so the benefit is this patient walks the next day full weight bearing the other thing is this bone cement gives immediate structural strength you can start immediate weight bearing and ablation and it is very easy to use and it is relatively inexpensive a packet of bone cement costs about 4000 to 5000 you get 40 grams of bone cement and in most of these cases you probably need one or two packets of this bone cement is some of fine this is a 50 year old gentleman who had a trivial fall at home he was unable to get up he had severe right hip pain and that was his x ray showing a fracture of the acetabula the femoral head has literally entered into the pelvic cavity due to a central fracture of the arm ct guided biopsy was done which showed metastasis of lung cancer so what do you do now total hip replacement with a ke any pelvic resection radiotherapy chemotherapy or curative and appropriate reconstruction it's a very challenging situation because the location is very very difficult to manage well first of all we did a staging of this patient with a pet ct that revealed he had a lung primary multiple skeletal and lymph nodal metastasis and more importantly brain metastasis it is very likely that he had a convulsion or he probably had some sort of uh, neurological event due to which he fell this patient has a lung primary brain mat lymph node mat and multiple skeletal mat what i would want to know is what is his likely survival how long is he going to live and that will decide what i am going to do for so how do i know how long is he going to live well there are various scoring systems where you can get a fair idea about the patient's survival prognosis this is one such uh, table for by category et al if we just try to score this in our patient he has a rapid growing lesion because he has got lung cancer that is 3 points he has visceral and cerebral metastasis basically that another two points or five points he is sort of bedridden now so that is six points he has not received any previous chemotherapy so it's still six and he has multiple bone metastasis so his score is seven points now we'll see what does that mean when he is scoring seven points his six months expected survival is just 31% and his one year survival is just 11% and two year survival is just 2% he was already neurologically compromised so in this patient we just advise radiotherapy and best supportive care he survived for just a month so there was no reason to operate him or if he had operated he would not have got any benefit from it. so the lesson here is the treatment that we offer must result in a useful gain to the patient primarily in the form of pain relief and preferably with restoration of useful function the complexity of the procedure that we do must be weighed against the expected gains so in this particular patient it would have been a very very complex undertaking but it would hardly have 
any useful case for this particular case number 6 this is a 26 years old lady who recently delivered a baby about 4 months ago she had a minor stumble at home and was unable to stand or walk since then and your x ray again shows a large destructive lesion in the proximal femur what do you think this is whether she has got a cancer whether she has got an infection we don't know well she came with her blood test to us and that's when we notice something that is very striking her calcium levels were high high her alkaline for phosphorus levels were also very high and then we sent her parathormon level because clearly her calcium metabolism looked deranged and her pth levels were almost a thousand so clearly this is a patient with primary hyperparathyroidism and what we are seeing is a brown tumor we did ultrasound of her neck and we could locate the parathyroid adenoma primary hyperparathyroidism is because of excessive secretion of parathyroid hormone from the parathyroid gland which goes uh, you know goes abnormally large so this is a benign uh, parathyroid tumor which needs to be surgically removed so before that we did a fixation of her uh, bone very important again in whenever we are dealing with a pathological lesion in the bone is to screen the entire bone you see she has a pathological fracture around the hip but you see around the supracondylar region she has another lesion she has another lesion in the distal condyle so very important whenever you do a fixation of these kind of uh, you know disease bones you have to take into account the other pathologies in the bone also so in her case we had to put in a very long nail which was almost reaching up to the articular surface of the um, distal femur otherwise we risk creating a fracture at the level where the nail ends so this is what this is another patient actually not the same patient but this is what happens when you uh, fix a, a brown tumor with a nail and then deal with the cause that is the adenoma it ossifies in a matter of Weeks and becomes rock solid. She doesn't need any sort of curative procedure here or any sort of cementation that we would do if it was a metastatic pathological fact. So knowing what disease you are treating is very important. There is no single formula for all this. So the lesson here is in any lytic lesion of bone and in any pathological fracture, keep the possibility of metabolic bone disease in mind. Understanding the cause of the fracture helps in planning the approach to fracture management, and it is important that you image the entire bone. Don't miss out on the skip lesion. And very importantly, in all these patients, you should also scout the entire skeletal system because she has a fracture in one bone. This is a systemic disease. Her other bones may be equally vulnerable, so you will have to do a skeletal survey, X-ray all the major long bones. and see whether there is any impending fracture elsewhere so that you can advise her to be careful case number 7 this is a 54 year old gentleman who had pain in the left thigh since more than a year was imaged for the same x ray and mri was done which showed a long pathology in the femur right from hip to knee this was the x ray and you see there is something that is eating away the bone and it's almost about to fracture this patient was not fractured but about to break so the mri was done and it was reported as feature suggestive of acute or chronic osteomyelitis of left femur the orthopedic surgeon sent some tissue for histopathology which was reported as suggestive of necrotic bone he did a interlock nailing and i expect that you know it would have settled with that but in a year later he developed a large swelling of the thigh there is something that is actually going on in this proximal in this entire femur in fact a mri was done which revealed a huge tumor right from hip to knee and it is basically occupying the entire thigh from deep fascia to deep fascia from one side to the other a biopsy was done which reported it as grade 2 chondrosarcoma there were no detectable metastases on pet scan and if you have come to 
this diagnosis was established at the time when he was treated with the nail it was an entirely intra osseous disease there was no disease in the soft tissue and it would have been quite straight forward to uh, do a limb salvage surgery on him by removing this entire femur and replacing it with an implant called a total femur replacement but by the time he has come to us it was too late and he had to undergo hind quarter amputation so the lesson here is do not operate on the basis of an assumption do not operate on the basis of an mri report on the ensure that your pathologist is experienced in reporting bone tumors so not all pathologists are comfortable or are experienced in reporting bone tumors or soft tissue tumors or sarcomas you should very importantly correlate the clinical imaging and histological findings to reach a diagnosis like if this patient had come to us and if the report was saying uh, necrotic bone i would have disagreed with this i'm sure dr satyakam would also have disagreed with that finding the radiology was also not suggestive of infection however lack of experience on the side of the radiology the surgeon and the pathologist created a perfect storm where this patient ended up receiving the wrong kind of treatment so this is what dr ratakam has also emphasized diagnosis is not just about findings on imaging it is not just about clinical finding that it is not just about the histological findings all of them have to basically correlate with each other and that's when you reach a diagnosis operate only when there is a clear diagnosis and after a complete workup of the patient so to summarize the three things that you cannot retrieve are the arrow sped from a bow or nowadays you can say a bullet from a gun the words spoken in haste and the missed opportunity and we can add a fourth one to this list that is this kind of procedure done with the before you know you are applied not to it so to summarize again pathological fracture is not a surgical emergency pathological fracture is not a single condition there are diverse causes treatment plan varies with the nature of the pathology the prognosis of the patient the stage of the disease the expected survival of the patient the so take home message this is very important for you because you are generally the first contact for most of our patient and it will be great if you can you know do this it is so very simple how should you suspect a pathological fracture just ask these four questions to your patient what was the nature of the injury was it trivial or high velocity did you have a much stumble at home did you just trip and fall or you fell from a height or you had a road traffic accident that is number 1 second question is did you have pain in the region prior to this fracture were you limping were you finding it difficult to walk or were you finding it difficult to use your arm before that did you have some pain did you have some swelling in that region number 3 is any past history of similar fractures have you been treated for a similar kind of fracture which has happened with trivial cause any time in the past and very important be any history of cancer any patient with a past history of cancer or who is currently undergoing treatment for cancer any sort of fracture in such patient should be considered pathological unless proved otherwise so pathological fracture is not a surgical emergency in pathological fracture pathology comes first fracture comes last focus on reaching the diagnosis and the rest of it all will fall in thank you Thank you very much for this informative case presentation, uh, Dr. Anjan. Uh, anybody has any questions? Uh, please mention it in the Q and A box. Also, uh, the doctor profiles and details have been uh, the link has been shared on the chat box. We'll wait for another I two will, minutes. Yeah, I will share. any questions i can answer yeah you can raise your hands if anybody wants to ask so we can i love you to talk is yes, dr lalit you can go ahead
or you can unmute yourself Okay, I think there are no more questions. No more questions. All right, thank you so much for your time. Okay. Thank you. Thank yes, thank you. It was a very informative, and there is a compliment also in the Q and A box. Thank you. In case anybody has any queries related to Dr. Satyakam, they can drop in their queries on the email ID I will mention in the chat box. So you can uh, ask him an opinion if you want to. All right, so we will be uh, closing the webinar. Thank you. Recording stopped.